Welcome everyone to our June um, AZ Bio Peers. And today we're having one of our favorite sessions, Tales from the Road. And that's where our CEOs and executive teams share their journey and how they've gotten to where they are today. And I'm very pleased to have with us um, Elsa Chiabruzzo from Annuncia and also Mark Geiger. And they're going to what, tell them a little bit about themselves. So with that, let's get started. Elsa, you're up. Thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is Elsa Chiabruzzo. As Joan said, I am a proud member of the AZ Bio community. I am president and CEO of Anuncia Medical, located at Skysong in, in Scottsdale. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, my, my story is kind of uh, a winding road, right? Uh, getting here from uh, not just moving the company, but uh, from, I didn't become a CEO through your, your traditional routes, right? Business, finance, and those kind, kinds of things. I'm an engineer. Uh, and uh, have been in medical devices for 35 years. And I uh, kind of want to keep this uh, interactive, Joan, so I'm not going to say as much to keep it more with questions and make sure Mark has a, has a chance to pop in there because he's amazing. So, Absolutely. And Mark, tell, them, tell our guests a little bit about yourself. Thanks very much. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, Mark Geiger, I work. Uh, with Anuncia Medical with Elsa uh, as VP Sales and Marketing. I've been in medical device for 32 years, um, about 16, 17 years in the CSF management space. And CSF stands for cerebral spinal fluid um, as you know, sales, marketing, salesperson in the field, selling products, developing new products to meet unmet medical needs um, in conditions in the CSF space like hydrocephalus, which is an abnormal accumulation of fluid in the brain, traumatic brain injury, and uh, other things in the CSF spaces. So i um, very excited. It's a, it's a fascinating field um, that is um, growing uh, rapidly for med device. And, um, and hopefully we'll get a chance to tell you more about um, what our product is and, and what unmet needs we're meeting. Awesome. Thank you so much. And um, Mark, you're more than just a life science executive in the field of um, cerebral spinal fluid. Um, do you want to tell the group what really motivates you to solve this problem? <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, yes, yeah, so I have hydrocephalus myself. Um, I was diagnosed when I was uh, 14 years old. Um, uh, hydrocephalus can be caused, there's a number of causes, but one of them is this clogging of the normal pathways that CSF uh, surrounds the brain, cushions the brain with. And um, the way, one of the main ways to treat it is with a hydrocephalus shunt. So I also have what's called a ventriculoperitoneal shunt, which is essentially plumbing for the head that you through a small hole in the skull, you access the cisterns called the lateral ventricles in the brain and connect it to a flow control valve. And then another tube comes under the skin and reroutes that fluid into the belly where it's reabsorbed. And so I had my initial shunt insertion, and then five, what we call revision surgery. So repeat surgical procedures all in those wonderful high school uh, years um, to uh, change out occluded or clogged plumbing, if you will. So a tube gets clogged, uh, the only way prior to our product, the reflow, um, they just have to do another surgical procedure to replace that part. Um, which requires a hospitalization, anesthesia, and all of those things. And it's really not uncommon to find people with hydrocephalus who've had 5, 10, 20, 30 surgeries. So for 70 years, it's been, if the car breaks down, instead of replacing the part that's broken, they've just been replacing the car. And that, uh, that analogy kind of rings true. And, and uh, I was talking to a patient earlier this week, and he said, isn't it crazy that people say I've only had five surgeries and you run into those people all the time. And, and I laughed at like, you know, you couldn't put it any better than that. So that's been my journey. I haven't had a shunt surgery since I was 18 years old, which is a few years now. Um, so very lucky um, in, in that regard. 
but um, you know, love the space. Working in the space was actually my mother's idea. Um, so I have to give props to mom for uh, recommending that I investigate. You, you know, one thing, Joan, that I wanted to add to that is the reason he says that some people say I've only had five revision surgeries. If you go on the Hydrocephalus Association website or look this up, there's some young people, there's a 21 year old athlete uh, on the website, beautiful young woman who has had over 140 surgeries. Can you imagine being that many times in the hospital, let alone having surgeries on your brain? Uh, and it's debilitating, it cause, causes cognitive impairment and all sorts of other uh, sequelae and issues. So, um, and, and what we like to say too, is that, uh, you know, just to put it into perspective, it, a lot of the younger uh, patients have more brain surgeries by the time they're 18 than birthdays. And, and this is true, but uh, one of the kind of misconceptions is that hydrocephalus is only a pediatric disease. Um, it isn't, you can get hydrocephalus at any time for a variety of reasons. Um, you can get it from brain tumors uh, because it clogs the pathways with extra protein and whatnot. You could get it from traumatic brain injury, brain bleeds, and brain bleeds can happen both as an adult or as, a, as even an infant. Um, in the developing world, um, it used to be that hydrocephalus was caused mostly by you know for congen by you know congenital reasons, uh, spina bifida and other uh, conditions, which now with great prenatal care, there's not as much of it in the developed world. It, but because we have such great care, uh, a lot of babies are being born much earlier. Um, and what happens then is that they have these vessels around the cavities that hold this hydro, this uh, uh, water, this uh, CSF fluid, cerebral spinal fluid. Um, and they're called germinal matrix vessels and they rupture because you're born early and you can't withstand, you know, they can't withstand the blood pressure. And so that's really the majority in the US of infant hydrocephalus now. Um, and, but there's about 70,000 cases in the US alone. Wow. Uh, about 45,000 are pediatric, about 25,000 or so are adult. And that does not include this new um, <clears throat> hydrocephalus called normal pressure hydrocephalus. And it affects uh, the elderly. Um, um, in fact, just recently we were talking to someone I used to work with in Israel because we were looking at expanding into other countries and uh, she's an MD there and uh, uh, amazing uh, uh, person with a lot of connections. And, and she goes, oh, yeah, my father was just shunted because he has NPH, normal pressure hydrocephalus. So that's how common that is. There's about 20 million people living with NPH in the world. There's about a 30 million with the typical hydrocephalus in the world. And there's about 700,000 to a million of those NPH patients in the US right now. They're underdiagnosed, uh, about 20% diagnosed because their symptoms mimic those of other conditions like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's uh, and dementia, right? They have cognitive impairment, they have memory loss, uh, they have uh, gait issues and all these things. That, but if they're shunted, they can actually, their symptoms can resolve within about six months to a year. And there's a huge randomized study called the Penn study uh, with one of our centers, actually, we're very proud, John Hopkins University uh, is one of the lead centers on that to look at shunting for these patients to resolve these symptoms. So um, don't wanna talk too much about, you know, the, the conditions and stuff. I wanna talk about how, how we got here too, but uh, it's just, you know, I think it's sometimes with what we do, uh, it's important to educate folks and we want, want to bring this awareness because um, a lot of people don't know about these conditions and yet you might know somebody who has this. So, right. so Elsa, um, you know, last year we celebrated Advanced Medical as one of our Fast Lane Award companies. And, um, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, the amazing progress that you guys are making. But unlike a lot of our companies, Anuncia didn't start in Arizona. So 
where did this technology and where did this idea originally come from? Great question. So originally, um, Anuncia was part of a company uh, that was founded in Massachusetts. Uh, it's in, in Lowell, uh, which is about an hour north of hour and a half, depending on traffic, north of Boston. Uh, and um, the company was a, a drug delivery medical device company that um, now is a gene therapy company. Uh, so, uh, you know, it evolves. And um, in 2014, uh, we license what now is the reflow technology uh, where we're, we're in a Gen 2 uh, that's about to launch next week on June 28th in the US. And um, that technology was licensed from Boston Children. And uh, Dr. Uh, jo Joseph Mattson, who is a world-renowned pediatric neurosurgeon, uh, developed this technology out of necessity because as Mark said, hydrocephalus shunts work great when they work but about 50% of them fail in two years. Uh, most of that due to uh, occlusions of the catheter that goes into the, the, those cavities of the brain that hold the, hydro, the CSF. And um, it's a huge problem. Uh, it, each of these revision surgeries are $40,000 per year. Uh, and, and the cost uh, to the healthcare system is over you know, 2 billion per year. Uh, it is actually one of the highest reasons for hospitalization for children uh, in the US. And um, so this technology, we licensed it, we developed it within Anuncia, I mean, within Alcyon, sorry. And um, in, we got it through the FDA and see, Mark, this is the, the, the poster of the old uh, Gen 1 technology uh, that I put in my office just to remind me. <laughs> um, and then, um, in 2018, we spun out of Anuncia, I mean, of Alcyon, we became Anuncia, and uh, we did this clinical validation of the product uh, in about seven, six, seven centers in the US uh, and um, got great data, uh, but then COVID hit. And during that time, we found out, as many companies know here that we evolve, right? We got feedback that, hey, this great works great, but you need to make it smaller. You need to make it easier to use. You need to also look at the, the expanding the indication because when it was originally made uh, or developed, it was to, if you had already symptoms of your catheter occluding, right? You had excruciating pain and nausea and vomiting and lethargy and these, these horrible symptoms then you could press this device at home underneath your scalp once it's implanted it, you, you can feel it and you can just press it and it would open up this occluded catheter alleviating the symptoms and buying you the time to get to the hospital to get revised electively because a lot of these emergency revision surgeries happen at night you make more csf at night uh, there's these tissues that make the CSF called choreoplexi that are more pre pre prevalent and can uh, occlude your catheter more at night when you're sleeping. So this was seen as a really fantastic use. But what we found out was that, again, necessity is the mother of invention. And, you know, some of the neurosurgeons that have really um, high occluding uh, patients with these multiple revision surgeries said, wait a minute, if this thing doesn't hurt, it doesn't interrupt what the valve is doing because when you're not in use, it's passive. And I can tell my patients to use it at home. Why am I going to wait for this catheter to become occluded? Why don't I just tell them to flush it every morning and every evening and keep this catheter open? And sure enough, that's what they did. They told us about it. Uh, we, we were able to uh, get some of the data that heck they had collected. And we went to the FDA and filed a breakthrough designation and, and uh, you know, got that. Then uh, FDA cleared and, and those data were just published in the Pediatric Neur uh, Journal of Neurosurgery. But right after COVID, Alcyon took a different route and the, the original founder told me, hey, you've been with this company since 2011. 
uh, I know you love this area and you love these patients and, and these docs because they're amazing. They really care so much about their patients. And he goes, you could either stay with Alcyon or you could become the CEO of Anencia because we're headed in a different direction. And I go, uh, okay, what a wonderful opportunity to challenge myself. I'm an engineer, I had done just about everything in manufacturing and quality, and I'm a regulatory expert, as you, as you know. Uh, I had done de development and uh, GMing a little. Uh, and I go, okay, I'll do this. Oh my gosh, hardest thing I've ever done. As, as the other CEOs that are here may know, it, it's a, uh, you get to work a lot harder, be responsible for everything. Uh, you get to hear a lot of no's. Everybody criticizes everything you do all the time. And you get to get a pay cut, which is awesome. <laughs> Half your salary. Uh, but uh, that said, I go, well, you know what? The world is changing. And why am I commuting? Because I had already moved to Arizona. I'm, I'm a trailing spouse. My husband works for Phoenix Children's. Uh, and I go, I'm just going to, you know, bring Anuncia here from Lowell, Massachusetts. So we really recruited a new team and uh, were so welcomed here by AZ Bio and AZ Tech and, you know, uh, GPEC and uh, Skysong and ASU. It was just such a wonderful community to really start a medical device company. And one of the things too is that Boston's fantastic and it has a lot of biotech and medical device and, and pharma, but really you're such a small, tiny fish. And if you're med tech, you're even like a redheaded stepchild there, right? Because biotech's king there. And so with uh, in the Arizona community, I just think it's just more balanced and just so much more supportive, right? With, uh, you know, the Wexford and Skysong and so many places that you can house yourself in so many uh, uh you know, tapping into different parts of this community. So we brought it here. I don't have to do the five hour flight to Boston every other week. Um, and by the way, Boston, if you guys are not familiar, there's always a blizzard every time you go, except for maybe three weeks during the summer. And so <laughs> I'm so glad we're here and, and thank you so much for asking that. So. Thanks and we're glad you're here too. So, Mark, you know, Alyssa says, oh, and we're launching this new product. She makes it sound so easy. Okay. Um, so it is not easy. What are some of the things and steps that you're focusing on today to bring the new Reflow Mini to the marketplace? Thank you. Good question. Yeah, is you can have the greatest uh, product in the world, but if not a lot of people know about it, uh, then uh, you're you're going to it's going to be a tough road to hoe, as my father would say. Uh, so it's about creating awareness. Um, the great news is is when I joined uh, Anuncia, there was all of this great uh, clinical data. Uh, right after I started, we had the May Journal article, which with fantastic results published in the journal Pediatric Neurosurgery. Uh, there was already lots of warm, enthusiastic leads because um, when I was director of marketing for the division of Medtronic that made shunts, uh, we had a scientific advisory board and we had surveyed about a hundred of our customers, the neurosurgeons, and the number one thing everybody wanted was a way to keep shunts working, to try to not have to always replace them with a surgical procedure but a way to keep them working. And there had been a couple of different mousetraps throughout history, but nothing like the reflow. And I knew Joe Madsen from way back in the day, 20 years ago, um, when I was uh, with Medtronic and he was on our scientific advisory board then and, and uh, really well-respected as uh, Elsa mentioned. But finally somebody did it, was, was really in a nutshell what I thought when I saw the reflow. Finally, somebody went out and did the work and it's really a decade of work to be here. So my job has been building off of that. Um, and it's, so we're not starting from zero. And I, as often as I can talk to neurosurgeons, we talk to probably 10 to 15 a week now, as we're, you know, following up on all of these leads and 
building out our base of business for you know getting ready for launch. We already have orders in the system that will ship on the 28th because people are so excited about it. We already have a doctor who said, hey, I've got a patient right now. Is the product out yet? Um, so there's lots of people waiting with bated breath because this strikes at the heart of the number one problem in hydrocephalus shunting. And so it was, it's exciting. It's a lot of work. You're building something. But as is typical with really novel medical devices is the end game is not the revenue and the implants. The end game is helping people. And when you can help people and change their lives, um, my parents used to say, well, my, or my dad used to say, well, I just resigned to the fact that we're just going to be going to the hospital every year and it's going to be two o'clock in the morning and Mark's going to be screaming, uh, you know, uh, wake up you know, screaming with a headache and driving all the way to the hospital, you know, two hours away. And some people drive lots longer distances than that. And we're just going to do it every year. And that's just the way life is going to be, but that's the cards we're dealt. And now um, the, the possibility um, and the clinical data backing up that we, we could change this market forever and change the lives of these patients. And I interviewed a mother of a child, um, uh, one of the patients from the clinical study just published. And she said, the, the two best words, she goes, the reflow gives us control and confidence. We can actually not have to be a spectator in this sport, just watching it all happen and hoping, you know, fingers crossed that everything works out okay. We can actually play a role in our child's therapeutic journey as prescribed by their neurosurgeon to play a part, to help with the theory, the rolling stone gathers no moss, to play a part to keep these things working instead of having to just always replace them. And so that's, um, it's, I, I, I think I speak for everybody at Anuncia is, and there's a lot of people working really, really hard behind the scenes um, to get this product out, uh, including Elsa, uh, who's wearing a number of different hats, is that that's really the end game is we know that we're onto something and we know that we can help a lot of people. And that's what gets people up in the morning to do their jobs. But by the way, John, yeah. Mark still wakes up screaming in the middle of the night for the <laughs> launch. <laughs> yeah, there's that. Yeah. But right. you know, I wanted to, you know, give a shout out because I'm actually looking at some of the the uh, folks on the on the you know call. Um, and uh, you know, there's folks uh, that I know from from Barrow, but this is such a great community here. Um, and you know, if you're gonna have uh, hydrocephalus. Uh, this is one of the best places to be, right? There's the Barrow Neurological Institute. There's uh, the Mayo Clinic. There's Phoenix Children's. There's Banner. Uh, Dr. Uh, you know, Peter Nakaji from Banner, just the, the Stead family just donated $5 million for their NPH program. This is such an amazing area uh, with uh, world-renowned neurological centers and hospitals of excellence. And, and uh, we are extremely lucky here, you know, in the Arizona community uh, to have that. So I just wanted to say that as I saw some of the folks on, uh, in the meeting, because uh, I don't think people realize uh, that. So one of the things, uh, Mark, that you kind of um, jogged in my brain, because I get this question all the time, is you talked about how you surveyed physicians to get their feedback. And that is one of the biggest questions that I get from um, emerging life science entrepreneurs is how do I get the docs to talk to me? How do I get their feedback when they're so busy? Any tips? Well, it is you go to where they go. Text them WhatsApp. <laughs> they never answer emails. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, a, a lot of it is, right, is, is breaking in. The hospitals, when I was a salesperson in that device in the 90s, it was pretty easy to get into a hospital. Now there's a number of different barriers. So it's you go to the trade shows, the scientific meetings that they go to, and you either walk the show or you attend the talks that they give, or you have a tabletop display or a booth at one of their trade shows. And, and that's the time at these annual meetings where they 
take the time to walk around the exhibit hall and see new products. And, you know, a lot of these doctors are walking around because they know what their unmet medical needs are. Um, and so when you can offer them uh, the hope or the promise of maybe addressing one of their unmet medical needs, they get very interested and that turns into a lead. And then you have typically a commercial person like a salesperson, either a direct or distributor that follows up and then helps work through the hospital system. Uh, there's a, most hospitals have a value analysis committee for every new product that may take months or a year to get the product to the system. Um, and then it gets approved. And then, and only then, typically the device can be ordered and used uh, by, by the doctor. And, you know, it's, there's a financial component to it. There's a, is there a competitive cross-reference to it? What unmet medical need is it meeting? Um, so there's a really, you know, long, arduous process uh, to get products into the hospital. And you need to have boots on the ground who understand and know all of the stakeholders in, the, in those respective, you know, world leading institutions like the ones that, that Elsa named to be able to get the product in. Well, it's about relationships too, right? So you, well, it's a data-driven industry, right? I mean, docs uh, are not going to use something if it's obviously if it's not, you know, FDA approved or part of a trial and there's got to be, you know, data to back up whether that's, you know, uh, preclinical data, but, you know, mostly clinical data. But it's also about, you know, if Joe Madsen used this and, you know, he thinks it's great and he has some data, he will share it with, you know, uh, Ed Ann of, you know, Mayo Clinic, you know, and folks who trained, you know, at Boston Children's who are now in all sorts of different places, they're residents and fellows from BCH that are in uh, Wisconsin and Westchester and uh, Mayo and all over the place, right? And the same thing with Barrow residents and Mayo residents. And so it's sort of this, you build it, uh, you know, these relationships and, you know, you have these champions that then understand and believe in the product because they've seen the data and, and, and word spreads, but it's a process for sure. So. I guess so I would think CRM would be extremely important because Absolutely. um you know in the business world we've all gotten really lazy and we re rely on LinkedIn, right? Docs right. are not necessarily in LinkedIn. And so, you know, having the right tools so you can keep track of them as they move around, which they do, right, is really important. Absolutely. I mean you you mentioned LinkedIn, but you know, these doctors are they're, it's the longest uh, training in, in medicine, seven years of residency. Often many of these pediatric neurosurgeons do another year of pediatric fellowship, and then they graduate and move around. I also mentioned relationships, and I couldn't agree more. The, the neat thing about neurosurgery and then pediatric neurosurgery, which is even more of a niche, is that a lot of these doctors know each other. We say instead of six degrees of separation, it's two degrees of separation. So a big part of what we do is uh, put smart people together. You know, one neurosurgeon may say, great, I'm thinking about using this, but who else, is, who else is using it? And we say, great, let's set up a webinar with you and you know, Dr. Madsen or uh, Dr. Iskandari or another pediatric neurosurgeon who's had experience with the product. And then we sit back and let the smart people talk about their experiences, you know, their patient selection, the specific applications they think are killer apps. And so it's really the density of connections and then the number of touches. You know, in sales, we say it takes seven touches before somebody um, gets to, from, you know, being exposed to the product to actually being a customer. So trying to create the number of touches and then there needs to be the need, right? The, the, a lot of these people are very smart uh, folks and they say, wait, I've got a couple of patients that I'm thinking about for this right now. Um, and as I mentioned <laughs> earlier is we had a doctor say, hey, is this thing out? I have a patient I could use this on today. Um, so um, there's, there's uh, all of those things together, uh, the relationships, the, the education, you know, the process um, is what then all comes together and uh, converges into 
you know, finally being able to help patients with a great new technology. Awesome. And, and by the way, the, the relationships are both ways, right? I mean, the, these physicians, these neurosurgeons, uh, a lot of them are inventors. Uh, a lot of them, like, you know, the Barrow and Mayo, they have wonderful you know, technology transfer offices and IP that we love to look at and, and, look, and look to see to license potentially new products or co-develop with them or do clinical trials. And I see a question, Joan, from um, Jared that says, are we manufacturing the devices in the Valley or is it done somewhere else? And uh, we are very fortunate because we actually have a lo two local manufacturers, I consider um, a Tucson local also, uh, but uh, there's a larger contract manufacturer in Tucson uh, that we intend to move to uh, when we're higher volume. And then we have um, a local contract manufacturer here uh, in Tempe uh, for our, our pilot programs and our initial uh, launches, so which is terrific because we like to see that, you know, not just the, the great ideas, but also, you know, how do we do that? So, um, Mark, you're having the opportunity to, to speak with patients and you are a patient. You know, what is the kind of feedback you're getting from the patients that have had the opportunity to have either the reflow or the mini so far? Yes. So I've had a chance to talk to uh, a number of the patients who were a part of that group of patients with the Gen 1 device, some of that published um, um, in May. Uh, and they, they all say the same thing is it's a relief because we're not waiting for the middle of the night, patient wakes up at 2 a.m. screaming and have to get everybody into the car and get to the hospital. That you feel like you're, you know, you're, you built a home next to a volcano um, in those types of situations. And that's the way that a lot of these parents are living. And I was on the board of directors of the Hydrocephalus Association um, for six years and a lot of patient events. Elsa's been to a bunch of them as well. And you get the sense when these parents are talking to you is it's serious business. Um, I said, I said one time in my twenties, when I went to my first par uh, parent meeting, I said, if these, is it, if these people, if these parents thought they could help their kid by killing me, they would do it because mm -hmm. that's how intense parents get who've been through uh, the ringer with hydrocephalus and shunt revisions and things like that. So, you know, you feel that intensity and you feel really that obligation. Um, as a company in this space is, you know, the, the revenue is always secondary. Um, and one of the founders of one of the companies that I worked with, um, Alfred Mann, who was a serial um, entre mm -hmm. entrepreneur and medical device, said, focus on patient outcomes. If you do well there, if you can create great patient outcomes, the money will come. I don't care mm -hmm. about the money right now. And that is that was you know a, a cultural synergy that you see as a common thread throughout a lot of these medical device companies is you you have to be in for the long haul and and i and i'll say it again a decade of work with alcyon and anuncia you could tell that they're in this for all the right reasons so um, let's transition here um to a smaller segment equally important um because if you don't have the money you can't do anything else so elsa as a ceo one of your number one responsibilities is to raise money what's it like out there well um pretty tough right now right so um i think that uh, actually medical device doesn't have it as tough as as biotech right now and you know because uh I think in this economy, uh, you know, the the SPACs and the IPOs have dried up, and that's a lot of what funds the biotech. And so it, it's a little tougher for biotech than smaller medical devices, especially since you know we have uh, FDA approvals and we have uh, a, a product that's about to launch in sales, which puts you in a completely different uh, category. But even then, it's a long road. 
Um, so with this, you know, you start off with, you know, friends and family usually. Uh, we were fortunate enough that we had a good base of investors coming out of Alcyon, um, and, and that has helped us quite a bit. So we've raised primarily through convertible notes. Um, I think we've raised since we've been in uh, Arizona uh, about uh, six million bucks or so. Um, and, you know, it, it takes that amount of money to really develop a, you know, an implantable medical device and get it through the FDA and get it tested and hire the folks and get it launched and develop the pipeline. Um, so um, it's, it's pretty tough out there. I do think um, that it, it's important for those, uh, for folks who are raising money to understand who invests in their company. Um, so, for example, in this community, I think it's a lot easier for tech to still raise money because this is what people know, right? There's, you know, chips and software, and it's a big area for that. I'm part of Arizona Tech Investors. Uh, I'm a member. Uh, I sometimes sit in that and I go, wow, that's an interesting technology, but it's sort of foreign to me, right? Because I've been in medical devices and life sciences for 35 years. So when I hear about, you know, this software or that has AI and does, it's harder for me to understand how that investment is going to go because it's not familiar to me. And so I'm more leery to invest in that type of company. And I have to defer to the folks at ATI that know that, that can tell me about it. And so same thing for medical device. So you really need to look at, uh, angel groups that know you, that know your type of business, uh, smaller VCs, and you've got to know who's uh, invest in what size round as well. So for example, you know, there's a lot of VCs that, micro VCs that will invest with angel groups, um, or, you know, like Accelerant, who's, who's wonderful, who's invested in us. Um, and, but there's, you know, certain VCs that won't touch you unless you're raising 10 million or 30 million. And so you have to know who those are and when you're ready to go to those. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big process. I had, um, somebody had told me, actually it was Dr. Madsen's wife, who is a, an investment banker, believe it or not, and, uh, and, and a physician as well. So she's definitely uh, an underachiever. Um, but she mentioned that you have to go through like a hundred pitches to you know, get somebody to invest. Easily a hundred pitches. Easily, uh, I I can't even begin to tell you how many pitches I've given so so far, and you know you'll hear a lot of great constructive criticism. A lot of what we heard was we love your product, uh, you know we don't invest that, you know in that small round, uh, or we need you to be commercial. You know we invest in growth companies, and so it it, it can be a, a daunting process. I did want to answer um, Joan uh, Julie's question. I think Mark answered some of that. Uh, what do patients and caregivers say about the spontaneity of the reflow? Uh, it's amazing. And, and, and the data, I think, although initial are fantastic, uh, in the nine patients that were published, uh, there's about a 90% reduction in those high-risk patients of revision surgeries. Um, and, uh, you know, and even if it's 10%, wouldn't that be worth it if this does no harm and it's an approved device that, you know, is small and can be, uh, you know, placed uh, when you're getting your shot. The other piece of it is there was a wonderful, um, some of our folks presented at, at, at a Canyon Angels event uh, that where students get to pitch for you and present your technology. And then, um, you know, they go into a breakout session with a CEO. And in this case, it was our CFO. And this uh, uh, angel investor saw us, uh, he's a car dealer uh, in Northern Arizona. And he says, I, you know, we weren't really there to, to raise money. We were just there more for the, the experience for, for these folks, for these kids. And um, he said, you know, I have uh, one of my triplets has hydrocephalus and I really want to invest in this company. And we got to talking and we were talking about how when you depress this reflow, and if it goes down and it refills, your catheter is most likely open because you can't press it all the way down and it refill with the, if, if the catheter is occluded. And so he goes, oh my God, that's fantastic because 
you know, my, my kid, he's, he's sometimes tired, right? And he has in lethargy is, is a symptom of, of, of occlusion. And I don't know if he's just tired or if I have to go and drive two hours to the hospital and spend five hours in the ER to find out he's just tired. And with this, I can at least tell, you know, if I need to rush to the hospital right away. So, um, you know, so it's been really empowering for these parents and for these patients uh, to have this. And we have a, actually some other products that we're coming out with that we think are going to even uh, empower patients more and really create this patient care continuum uh, from when they come into the neurocritical care to when they uh, exit. And then uh, also the other part of the question from, from Julie was, um, does your device depend on other industries uh, in, in uh, the AZ biotech community? And sure, so we do have our contract manufacturers here. Um, we, we Our components, silicone, uh, mostly silicone and, and peak and plastics like that, right now uh, we get them from the usual suspects that, that people do. And so that we need more of that here. Um, we will, as we develop wearables and we develop um, uh, uh, electronics for monitoring and real-time monitoring of, of, of uh, um, what they call intracranial pressure and these, these flows and, and brain compliance, uh, we will be needing chips. And of course, you know, what a better uh, place to be in in the world than, you know, in Silicon Desert, right? And, um, and then really it's the brain power. Right, it's it's the industry that you don't think about. It's it's the folks at ASU and these hospitals and U of A that have these amazing technologies that they're developing or that you know can help you with your preclinical studies or your testing or your clinical trials because that's a big part of what we do and you don't think of them as vendors specifically, but their, their industries, academia and healthcare that you couldn't exist in, not just because, you, you know, they're your customers, they're really, your, you know, your folks that contribute to what you're doing. Great, thanks. So we're coming up to kind of where we wanted to, um, you know, go back to more patient or more group questions. But before we do, I want to give you each a chance to um, you know, give a closing thought. Put yourself in, in the seat of the entrepreneurs that are in the audience. Um, Mark, what are you know, one or two things that they really need to focus on to be successful? Yeah, I think the first is to very clearly know what problem you're solving. So many people like to talk about features and benefits, but really the number one thing is you have to have a very clear statement, a clear vision about what problem you're going after. Be very focused and very targeted at that. And then you can get into the features and benefits and all that. But if you don't know what the problem is and it's not clearly stated in everything that you do, your promotional materials and your website and your sales pitch uh, or pitch deck, um, then that is um, th then you really need, you have some refining to do. Um, a lot of things that I've seen and been exposed to are technology in search of an application. You've heard that before. But when you can say very <laughs> clearly in one or two sentences, the elevator pitch, here's what our product is, here's what problem we're solving, and here's how we're doing it. Um, that uh, goes a long way. And I think that's a very tight value proposition that Anuncia has with the reflow product. Elsa? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, a lot of folks, you know, uh, you know, the saying, you know, if uh, you have a hammer, everything's a nail, right? So um, you, I think that uh, having the, the right product, knowing that you're solving something that there's a need for is, is crucial to the success um, of any, any company, right? Uh, but as a CEO uh, or as a founder, you really need to uh, just have perseverance. Uh, you have to have thick skin. Uh, you have to uh, be hopeful, you know, uh, optimistic uh, for sure. 
um, because you know you're you're uh, look. Some people are going to get it. Some people aren't. You know, some people are going to invest. You know, some people aren't. And it, and it's going to take time, and it's a process for sure. Um, so if you don't have that uh, persistence, and and you and you have to network like crazy all the time, right? You have to be willing to listen and change and adapt. I have probably revised my numerous pitches depending on who I'm pitching to hundreds of times, right? Uh, thank God for, uh, you know, great mentors. Uh, you know, I think uh, uh, Keith Stumbach was here. I think he maybe popped out, but, uh, you know, listen to your mentors, listen to your, you know, your uh, board, listen to investors, you know, don't take things personally, <laughs> you know, and, and learn from each experience. All right. So um, as we, you know, I'm looking in the chat, I just threw out a, a last call for questions um, and I don't see any. So I am going to um, thank Elsa and Mark for a, a great discussion today. And also thank all of you for joining us um, for this edition of AZ Bio Peers and Tales from the Road. Um, we're gonna be taking July off because as things heat up in Arizona, people like to get out of Dodge and uh, we'll be back in August and we look forward to seeing you then. Take care everybody, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.